Okay, well, uh, update. <laughs> Let me get these things out. <clears throat> the issue with the autopilot, I think I've got to the bottom of it. Here's the control head. Um, the Raymarine system basically is three parts. The control head, the APU, the thing that actually controls the autopilot, and the um, accelerometer. And everything else seems to be working fine. Uh, this was off and has been off now for 24 hours. It really slows me down. I can still sail, we've done pretty well, but you know, it's slow, slow, slow. But what I realize is oftentimes with the Raymarine stuff, the issue is not the actual unit, it's the wires. I'm not even gonna touch anything because I'm so nervous, but these black and white stripy wires that are in here, they short out. Um, there's a junction box up in there, you can see. So I've disconnected the wire that normally runs across to here where the uh, autopilot lives and I had one very short like 30 centimeter 12 inch uh, little um, Raymarine uh, cable in my kit and I've managed to connect that up and hey, it's back on so <laughs> What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna let it run for a little while now which I should give myself a rest and then I'll come back in and see if we can uh, solidify this repair and try and work out how exactly that's gonna how that's gonna be waterproof and safe but the boat's driving itself here we go we're on course 350 we've got seven seven and a half knots here mains pulling nicely we've got a lovely day i think we've got my hat on here is that she uh, aj's hat rather well, dashing um when you haven't got the autopilot but you're making your way forward it's just so frustrating all the time because you could be going quicker you could be closer to the course so it's very nice now just to even have an hour that this might work um, but obviously we'll come back and see if we can't work out a little bit more deeply what's going on but we'll wait until the the, the heat of the day is gone woohoo and uh, see if we can uh, make a better repair but for now it's doing what it's meant to do we'll work out why there's a 10 degree difference soon enough we got eight knots I'll call that a win for now Okay, well, hang on to your hats. We're going to try something a little bit different here. I recognize that in terms of creating the content and getting it to you, it's very difficult for me to be creating narratives and stories as I'm going along and uh, explaining everything as I'm going along. So I thought what I'd do on this trip is film more just silently and then put a narration in over the top. And, um, you know, maybe I can pick up on mistakes I've made and take the piss out of myself a little bit. So here we go, just some of the normal aspects. I'm picking a very flat time to do this. It's not just a, a regular chore. I'm, I'm picking a time when it's safe to be on the back there. And just getting the, um, the suntan cream off the, the life jacket to neck. Hey, just a little bit of soap and a scrub. It comes right off, gets rid of all the mold and everything. And then a site you don't really want to see in port, or certainly not the way I was taught to go boating. But uh, at sea, I quite like the gypsy life. A nice when the sun position and the sail position line up and you get some shade it was pretty darn hot on this trip i can tell you obviously not much uh airflow through a little boat like that all right yeah so now what we're going to do is i've filmed an entire evolution here um it's a jibe and i could explain every single thing that's going on here but maybe just if you have a question ask me pointedly i think what i want to talk about is things that are happening on the boat and maybe my philosophical approach to doing this kind of thing let me give you an example like I'm doing something very specific here I'm moving the traveler but when I'm doing this I'm thinking about jibing an open 60 in the southern ocean with huge amounts of power in the mainsail and a very negative outcome potentially if you do a crash jibe right so as I do this I'm thinking very carefully about the different parts here we go here's the the runner that's going to be coming off this boat has no permanent backstay so that runner is going to come off so I'm getting it ready although of course you could just do all of that when it comes time to release it but I'm setting it up as though I may have to act quickly if something starts to go wrong I will be able to quickly get that backstay off which is the most likely biggest problem that's can happen in this situation that the main goes across the old back stays still on it starts to power up and round the boat up now it's clearly like what 10 15 knots out there if that we're on a massively wide 30 odd foot wide trimaran but still every time I do everything look at how many turns are on that winch everything is done as though you're doing it on a much more 
um, highly powered boat. And in that way, I have avoided serious injury and serious damage to boats for 20 odd years. So the other winch on the other side is ready to go. And this is the backstay that at the moment is under the mainsail. It's scandalizing the mainsail, making a mess of the airflow over it. But it's on and tight, which means I can let the other back stay off and the main can just fling through on its own. Now you see I did a little hitch when I put the uh, safety turn onto that backstay. Because it's a backstay winch, because it's a backstay winch, I want to be very certain it doesn't come undone. So when I put my backstay winches on, I do that overhand loop. Now see I'm putting loads of slack out here now because I recognize when that traveler goes across, it's going to need to have loads of slack in that runner for it to be able to lower right down to the other side. Start to turn the boat. Now I've got the main in pretty close to the center line. I haven't done anything with the head soles. I've got the traveler across to the new position and cleated on both sides. Oh, there goes the main. And we know the runner is off. So there's very little turning uh, effort at the back of the main trying to round the boat up. Now, the other thing is that the headsail is still on the wrong side of the boat. But that's there again because in a more powered situation, if that main does go through and starts to round the boat up and you can't get the backstay off quickly, the backed headsail will stop the roundup. So even though I, I know I'm filming this, obviously, when I'm doing it, and I know I'm going to talk about it later on, but I'm not doing anything here that's out of the ordinary. I'm completely filling the, the winches with, with rope. The handles are, are always either in your hand solidly, held like a baton, um, it, you know, right by the, the shank, uh, not by the rotating handle part. They're in the pocket or they're in the winch. On this boat, there are no pockets for the winches, so I have to stow them on the cabin top. But you see how they're out the way in the least likely to fall overboard position. So I say, I think if I can film these things whilst I'm out on the boat and uh, have a bit of a discourse, have a bit of a discussion about what I see, I'm, see, I'm showing, look, how my hand has to be super open and very aware of where the pressure is on everything. I'm trying to lower the traveler down, but I've got two issues that are working against me. Number one, as we'll see in a second, the traveler block on that side has been damaged during the race and I'm unable to replace it. So it is made up of a piece of Dyneema, some sheaves, <laughs> some, <laughs> some ball bearings and like other loose bits together that used to be a block. But if you wiggle it all through, it will bear the load. You just have to wiggle it through. So fingers very, very light on the rope. Don't get into any situations where you can... Um, see, I'm not holding the rope entirely. I'm like just sliding my fingers past it because I know, okay, if there's suddenly a crash jibe and it's not cleated and that rope starts to go through quickly, I need to be able to retrieve my hand instantly. Always coiling up the rope. God, how I hate rope. <laughs> Spend my life tidying bloody rope. Okay, and then they see there's that slack for the, uh, the main sheet traveler to be in that position. And then you can lock off the, the uh, backstay. Any tighter and something somewhere, any tighter on the traveler position, and it would have uh, created problems later on. Go around and make sure my winches are exposed. Here goes the main sheet going back on. It was cleated during the jibe. Load it up, take some load on the winch, and then open the clutch. Safety turn on. Yeah, see I'm looking like those kinks, it, that's the backstay on the other side. If I have to let go of that backstay in a crash jibe and I've got to get it off quickly, will those kinks go through that, um, that clutch ahead of the winch? They might get around the winch, but they might get stuck as pigtails in the jammer and that will create a big problem. So it's worth the 10 seconds to make sure the line has got no kinks in it. Look around, look around, look at all the parts, critical eye. And that's how we do a jibe. So if you like that kind of narration over the top of things, just put a like down below. If you enjoy this content, please consider putting a like against this video or subscribing to the channel. And if you want more information, if you want to see more of the videos and more content, please consider going to patreon.com forward slash the mariner. Okay, well, seeing we're meant to be going north to Bermuda, that would seem like that's a bit of a problem, the fact that we're heading uh, just uh, to the north of the east, doing two knots. But what I'm trying to do is the solar cells on the port side of the boat are not working, and uh, it's going to need to be a little bit flatter water, a little bit.
bit drier before I can actually get out there and find out what's going on. If indeed we can work out what's going on. I've looked at the junction boxes, there seems to be nothing there. I've looked at the little uh, junction that I was working on yesterday. This had a bad connection where it was rubbing up underneath the boat. I made connections there. Yesterday they were fine, but overnight something's gone wrong. So I've only got half my solar cells working. And uh, with the autopilot running today in this kind of choppy swell, we'd be doing 10, 12 knots. Um, the autopilot's drawing a lot of power. We've only got two lead acid batteries. Then with the refrigerator going, it's just too big a demand overall on the electrical system. So I've hove two, which has put the starboard side of the boat into the light. Obviously the sail is putting the port side of the boat into shade when we're uh, when we're going north. So by heaving two, I've now got some charge going on in my batteries. 12.56 there, I think you can see that guy. Still very low numbers, but uh, what can you do, right? There's no way to charge on this boat. So the boat, when it first came, had these wonderful Solbian panels and uh, lithium ion phosphate batteries, which are you know, easy to manage and easy to maintain. And the boat's not trying to operate in the way that it is now, like crossing oceans. This is a 1500 mile passage. It's not going into cloudy areas where it was operating before with Jason and Claudia. It's like bright sun the entire time. So, well, in my mind. <laughs> so, um, we're gonna go to Bermuda, which is only now like 400 miles ahead. And uh, we'll see what we can sort out with these solar panels. And we'll see what we can sort out with these lead acid batteries. Um, maybe at best get a really good charge in them. And what we might do is just get a little uh, suitcase generator and a battery charger. And if we get to this kind of situation, then we can do something about it. But if it gets overcast and it gets windy, which is like any, any storm at all, we can't charge. And then the autopilot's gonna deplete the battery very, very quickly. So we'll keep adapting. 12.62 when the sun's strongest. The sun's kind of low in the sky now. We're about 20, let's just have a quick see here. 25 north right now. So Antigua's at about 17, 18 north. So we've come a good, you know, 400 miles already to the north. Um, but the sun's still gonna drop quite quickly. Anything, Tropic of, we might drop, we passed the Tropic of Cancer like, I don't know, like 120 miles ago, a bit more, 120, 180 miles ago. I know whenever I've lived in the, those kind of tropical regions, the sun drops very quickly at night. So once the sun gets down where it's about like a fist and a half, two fists above the horizon, the angle of the light coming into the solar panels, there'll be very, very little coming off. But what I can do is look at the app on the, uh, on the tablet and see when that solar panel output drops and then we'll just turn around and get going. So we'll make some, not make hay while the sun shines, we're gonna make some power while the sun shines. Uh, I'm gonna get the washing up done on the back here and uh, just do what I can. We've got two days to go. 12.4, that's not too low, is it? I know in some circumstances that might be considered, you know, pretty much an empty battery, but uh, we can push the chemistry a bit further than that. So that's where we are right now. Best to relax into it, do what we can, and as always, just try and make the best of the situation. <laughs> it's kind of simple, but you can't get much better than uh, macaroni and cheese and some sausages. These are a Lincolnshire sausage that I got in the um, in the supermarket in Antigua, and it's like the only sausage that they make, or the only sausage they sell. There's a reason why we are doing a balancing trick every night of refrigeration, autopilot, and like basic functions on this boat as we try and work out the power situation. There's some real gems in the refrigerator and I don't want to lose them. So I'm cutting through them as quickly as I can. But tonight and probably tomorrow morning is sausages. I'm not going to eat all this now, but that looks like uh, dinner and that looks like breakfast to me. 